Hi, everyone. We're so glad you could join us today. My name is Beth Barrick. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at NetSpy, and I'm joined today by two fantastic cybersecurity leaders. Uh, Joe and Conan, we're so excited you could be here with us for this really interesting conversation about BISO versus CISO. So with that, I will kick this off by letting Joe, you introduce yourself, and then Conan, I'll have you introduce yourself as well. So Joe, why don't you get us started? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, thanks. fantastic to be here. Uh, looking forward to this for sure. Um, so I'm Joe Vangelisto. I'm the CISO here at NetSpy. I have been in IT in some shape or form for about 26, almost 27 years now, and been specializing in security for the past six or seven, uh, being a CISO for the past five. Uh, so very excited to, to be here and have a chance to talk with Conan. Thank you. And Conan Sandberg, I've been with uh, Trimble just over uh, two years. I support our transportation segment of the company with uh, everything cybersecurity. And then previously, I was at Unite Health Group and Optum, uh, a couple of various roles. And then prior to that, I worked at the NSA and was at active duty Air Force for a while with IT and cybersecurity in many various roles. And uh, I support various segments of transportation logistics from really bridging that gap between cybersecurity and business oriented uh, goals that we have. Wonderful. Thanks to you both. And again, we're going to have a great 30 minutes of conversation, and then we'll have some time for all of you to have some questions. But as we're talking and as we're having these conversations, if things pop out to you, things that you might want to know more about, feel free to put those in the chat, and we'll make sure we get to them at the end of our conversation. So I want to start off, I think, Conan, with you, because I think most of us really know what a CISO is. You know, those of you listening have either worked for or with a CISO. Um, and again, if you want to put what your role is currently into the poll you have uh, up right now, that would be great. But I would like to start with you, Conan, because I do think that a lot of people don't necessarily know what is a business information security officer. And can you tell us a little bit about what your role actually is? Definitely. So when we, when we think about uh, cybersecurity strategy for a company at a high level, that's typically driven by a CISO overarching. And when we think about all these different facets of some diversified uh, companies, maybe you have different segments, different areas, different departments, really trying to understand and, and get ingrained with the business on business objectives, especially if there's different uh, areas, such like at Trimble, we have multiple different segments of our company, some doing construction, some doing transportation logistics, field systems. And we're thinking about these different areas, having really a security champion for that business. It helps us work with sales, marketing, product engineering, understanding the products, understanding the goals and objectives of our specific business unit, while also still driving our CISO cybersecurity strategy across the business. Wow, it's so interesting because, you know, I looking at the poll to see you guys will find this interesting. There are uh, a, a number of execs on this call who are CISOs and VPs, but we have a lot of people who are actually folks that would probably work for a BISO or a CISO. So, you know, Conan, what you said was so interesting because obviously in a very, very large organization, you're going to have a set of BISOs and those BISOs are going to be responsible for tying business to security. So Joe, I know, you know, we at NetSpy don't have that luxury of, you know, being able to have those BISOs in place. How do you think of that function within a smaller org? Yeah, I think when you think about it from a smaller org, you know, we have those functions already. We just may not call them BISOs, right? We have oftentimes when maybe called business partners or security business partners, or just really security champions throughout the organization who uh, care about security and have that insight and depth that I see so will then have to leverage, you know, to do what I do on a day in a day out basis, right? So it's just a matter of the structure is different based on the size of the company, right? Um, the bigger you are, the hard it is for a CISO to have time to delve into those specific departments and those specific areas, right? We just don't have that luxury when you're at a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand, 10,000, 20,000, you know, employee company. You know, when you're a smaller company like ours, where you have 650, it makes sense for me to be able to spend that time with those departments directly and try to work with them, interact with them as well. But it doesn't mean I don't need help, right? It just means I just don't have full-time help. And instead I have to leverage what's available in the departments as they exist today and the experts who are there to kind of fill that gap for me. 
Yeah, and that's a really good point. Because I think, Conan, you know, for you, you're working very closely directly with those business people in your business. Um, but again, right, every one of those business units, every business person has different goals and objectives to meet. So how, and I'd love to have you answer this, Conan, and then Joe, you think about how do you do that? Because you're not as direct line of sight. But Conan, how do you sort of relate to those people who, you know, obviously have really different functions you than you um, and get them to understand how to share with you projects they may be working on that you definitely want to know about as a security leader? Definitely. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like everyone's job is, is security. So like building a, a culture and relationships around that. So one of the things I, I love that I get to do is, is talk with our sales folks, understand what their objectives are, get to know them too, and build some of those relationships from senior leadership in those functions down to the people that are boots on the ground. And then on top of that, with our marketing team and our product engineering team, understanding what product roadmaps we have, what sprints look like, what the developer's capacity is, how many different things are responsible for. So I really get a full picture of everything the business is doing to where I can then look at our CISO strategy and plug in where I see appropriate, where I'm not necessarily throwing a lot more work on their plate, but figuring out how our strategy can complement them and really be a business enabler at the end of the day. Cybersecurity is a ever growing area and it, it's a huge competitive market advantage too. So equipping our salespeople with understanding some verbiage and baseline cybersecurity stuff that we have in our products, be able to speak to it, marketing team, be able to have content for it. And on top of that product engineering team, they want to do the right thing. So getting them the tools and resources to do that to where I'm getting our CISO strategy implemented while also moving our business forward by understanding what their goals are and showing how cybersecurity can complement those goals. Yeah, I love that, right? Talking about security as a business enabler, right? I'm sure everybody listening has heard that people think security is a blocker to what they're trying to get done, right? Not a business enabler. And, you know, Joe, something unique, I think, that you've done here at NetSpy is you are very open to this whole ask me anything idea. You know, you are constantly posting things in Slack and getting to know all kinds of people here at NetSpy that are well outside and beyond your security scope. And so I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on how did that come to be? And why do you feel like that's so important to, you know, just show up in the, you know, random Slack and, and start sharing things and having asked me anything? Sure. Yeah. I mean, to me, you know, the biggest, the worst thing you can do is, is not communicate and not be open and not be willing to partner with the other businesses. At the end of the day, we all have the same goals as the company. We're, we're all trying to accomplish the same things for the company. We just have different ways of going about doing it, right? Sales has got to sell. Marketing's got to put it, you know, our name out there and get us recognition, right? Our security consultants have to do the pen test and stuff, right? So my job really is just to help support that, uh, regardless of what that is, in the best way possible and doing so in a manner that is protecting the company and reducing our risk, right? And the best way to do that is by not being a blocker, to Conan's point earlier, right? It can't be the you know the department of no. Uh, instead, you have to be department of like, okay, you want to do X. How can I help you get there, but in the most secure and efficient way possible? That doesn't put the company at more risk. That doesn't mean that I don't say no sometimes, because sometimes you have to, right? Sometimes it is just like, look, this just isn't a good idea, right? But that really should be the exception. And in the end, you know, you really just want to partner with those people. And again, the best way to do that is to talk to them, interact with them, meet them on a regular basis. You know, when I'm in town, I try to talk to people at the water cooler. Right, and see what's going on with him. Make a personal connection uh, as well, because when you can relate with somebody and you can get along with somebody, you're more willing to work with them and help them than if they're just someone you never hear from and they're in some ivory tower just pushing down policy and not actually understand what the business is trying to accomplish. So, to me, the best way is you got to be, you know, in the weeds of people and and help them and work with them and show them you care. Yeah, that's great because, you know, in the so in the poll that we just put out for you guys, if you had seen it, about a third of people that are on this call today really are unsure about how to make sure that security aligns to the goals of the business. And so, Conan, I want to kind of toss this back to you because, you know, in our in our pre-work sessions and pre-work conversations we've had, you brought up some really good specific highlights um, and examples of how you have actually proven to people in the business 
that security actually is helping them and drive for their agenda. So, you know, one of the ones I thought was a great example was something you brought up about the developers that you were talking to in the business. You want to Definitely. share that anecdote? That was a great, that was a great aunt story. Definitely. So there's a couple of different facets when we think about um, having that champion or our security officer inside the, the business area. Um, some of the things that uh, just to add on to Joe's point about that relationship building, I get the opportunity to send out uh, newsletters of like general cybersecurity stuff going on, say uh, like MGM and Caesars last year, or like just big things that we see in the news. I'm able to send that out. So it just catches their eye. Uh, I mean, we see cybersecurity in our day to day lives, so I can see how it can tie into them, get them a little excited about it. Uh, on top of that, sending out Patch Tuesday emails, like really just staying engaged. And uh, in addition to like Joe has his uh, forums to communicate, uh, I have some of those set up too with our different product engineering groups. And it really helps bridge that gap of I'm here to help you. Uh, and then from our, our sales and marketing side, uh, being that business enabler piece, I uh, get the opportunity to show them what our SOC 2 type 2 report is, what our ISO 20,001 report is understand it to where they can talk to it to show this is a business enabler. And uh, a lot of cases it's become a requirement too. So when we can be more proactive in these conversations with prospects or customers and they feel confident behind talking about cybersecurity and showing the things that we're doing here at Trimble, it ultimately makes all of us better. And at the end of the day, when our salespeople are talking about it, our product engineering people are talking about it, we're accomplishing the goal of our CISO while also accomplishing the goal of our business leaders. Yeah, and and something too, Conan, that you had pointed out to me, and I'm sure Joe, you know, you have had this experience too, where you talk with developers and say, you know, if we can help you build code more securely, right, that's going to be better for the applications our business uses every day, right? There's going to be, you know, that really. So I think using really specific examples, and and Joe, I'd love some examples of, you know, conversations you've had where people don't really see that alignment of business and security. Cause I do think that's a, that's a challenging thing to do, but I also think that, you know, both of you are really uh, very passionate about being good communicators and connecting those dots. So I think any guidance Joe that you can give to other CISOs listening or people in IT or security listening about how to approach those conversations with someone in sales or marketing would be really helpful. Yeah, I think I think the best way to do that really is to connect on a personal level, right? Make them understand how it means something to them personally, right? And the reality of it is, is that the things we try to do in a company to keep us secure also keeps them personally secure and safe, right? Those same, you know, methods you're being taught about how to spot a fish, how to, you know, keep the uh, text messages to look, you know, nefarious from impacting your lives, those same things impact you as a person, your family is as well, right? And we've all heard stories of family members who have fallen prey to an attack or, or lost money or whatever, and it's horrible, right? So that's one method you can take, which is to say, look, this isn't just about, you know, protecting us as a company. Yes, of course, that's what we want to do. But this also helps you understand how to protect yourself in your personal life as well, right? So I think it's a good way to tie those in for some of those areas that maybe aren't as technical as the other areas. And on the technical side, you know, when I talk to my developers and such, one of the things I try to stress to them is, hey, look, at the end of the day, if you address the security problems now, while you're developing the code early on, then later on, when you're doing an actual, you know, scan of the environment or doing a pen test or something, you'll have less findings. And it's a lot easier to pick something early than it is later, right? Because the later it is in the process, if it's live code or whatever, it's now, potentially risky to the company, right? Maybe someone has a way to get in, but it also means it's a lot harder to fix because you gotta create a bug patch and hope it doesn't break something else. And it's all very fast and furious and get this done quickly, right? And there's no like time to really kind of think through it. So really it's just emphasizing that like this will actually save you time and frustration later and maybe even a late night or two if we can kind of pull this in, you know, and do this as part of your normal, you know, development process as opposed to waiting until after the fact. Yeah, that's a great point. And it sounds like, you know, you also, Conan, have this idea of you have to communicate early and often, right? And you have to, you know, make sure that you put yourself out there and go make those relationships and, and have those conversations with people before there's an issue. So, you know, that's just something I'm getting from both of you, right? Is that it's really important for people to see security as a business partner in the business, um, but also to, 
talk to people beforehand, right? Understand what they're what they're trying to accomplish before there actually is an issue. Because I would guess that then when there is an issue, it's a lot easier to work through. Would you say, Conan, that's pretty accurate? Absolutely. And I mean, it really opens that door up to communication where if they have a question or they're unsure of something, like people want to do the right thing, they know they have a liaison or partner to go to in that situation as well. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, one thing I would also ask is I think a lot of people now are thinking about, okay, now I have some concrete ideas about how to better align myself to the business, but how, now that I, I have that, how do I actually share with people my security spend or my security projects? Like, how do I think of that the other way around? Right. You, we talked a lot about business people sharing what they're doing with you and you inserting security into it. Um, I want to flip the script a little and talk about, you know, you all have security objectives that you need to, to get out there. Right. And how are you measuring that? Right. Is it number of vulnerabilities? Is it, you know, reducing the amount of phishing links clicked on? Like, what would you say, Joe, is sort of the metric that you use and how do you explain those important metrics to the business? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's any number of like, you know, mathematical gymnastics you can do to kind of prove that you're, you know, being more secure. There's the pair of methodologies out there and other things as well. They get quite complicated and overwhelming, right? And I'm not sure how successful they are really helping the business understand, you know, what's actually happening, right? So it, it's still important, right? Let's, let's not make, you know, lie to ourselves. It's still important to understand like how many vulnerabilities you have, you know, the phishing rates, those standard, you know, metrics are still necessary, right? They still help paint a, a picture of what's important and how you're trying to address those, you know, day in, day out kind of IT hygiene, cyber hygiene kind of things, right? Those, I and mean, I don't see those going away anytime soon. But I think the other metric is really the kind of intangible one, right? It's more of a, a feeling that you get from when you're talking to people, right? And one of my favorites is, you know, a couple of years ago, I had started off when phishing campaigns were still a relatively new idea, right? And you're sending out phishing and, and testing your employees and all, right? And I remember we'd been doing this for a few months and we were getting better and the numbers were getting better. And I was going down the hall and someone grabbed me and said, hey, I saw the phishing email. You almost got me today, but I didn't fall for it. I deleted it. So I want you to know that. And they laughed and they chuckled and they walked off. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, we didn't launch a phishing campaign today. So that was not a phishing attempt, right? That was an actual true attempt. Well, that was like a real fish. To, yeah. A real fish, right? But that's, that's me is kind of the really intangible ways of knowing to like, it's sinking in. They get it. They understand it. They're, they're trying to do the right things. And it's not an onerous thing. They want to share those stories, but they want to be like proud of the fact that they're doing the right things and they're trying to help us, right? That to me tells me that I'm hitting that right tone of, you know, engaging them, sharing from the why, helping understand what's important. And, and those metrics are actually then, you know, showing that in, in evidence form. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, you know, in our poll, Conan, this is interesting. So um, we asked our, our poll question about, you know, what, what factors are you offering as a security professional to prove uh, your security program? And most of the answers are very traditional things like reducing incidents, reducing alerts, right? Reducing time to remediation. Um, but, you know, Joe was just talking about some intangibles. So what are some of the other like intangibles like that, that you would say help you prove that, there is that two-way street with people in the business around security. Definitely. I think there's a handful and I get some of the perspective on being kind of that partner with the business area. I can see like some of those different intangible items with like customer requirements, say if they require a SOC 2 type 2 or they require high trust certification, depending on what industry you're in, PCI, so on and so forth. Or if it's just even information security terms and agreements within your contracts, when you can quantify these items, of how much ARR or uh, revenue that these certain customers bring in. You can measure those things based on your involvement that you had. Uh, customer security questionnaires, we probably all do them. Um, a lot of questions typically when they come in, they might take a lot of time, but that's still another item that uh, if you do or do not measure it, uh, if you're completing them, you're enabling your business to move forward with that prospect or customer in some sort of capacity too. So capturing some of those items. In addition, we also think about when I'm able to ingrain myself with product engineering folks, look at their cloud subscriptions, look at their on-premise footprint, the technology they use. When we're looking at all these vulnerabilities getting reported, sometimes there's like a root cause underneath where we can see if we change the architecture this one way, or maybe we migrate to a different solution in some capacity, we resolve 
maybe 500 vulnerabilities in the root cause of it. So really be able to do more root cause analysis. So measuring some of those larger objective items. And then uh, other topic is just tech debt. When we think about business objectives, you're looking to reduce operational expense, increase revenue and cybersecurity side, we're looking to reduce vulnerabilities. So when we think about where a lot of those vulnerabilities reside, legacy systems and tech debt. So when we think about creating a collaborative strategy between the cybersecurity side and the business and tech partners, to be able to minimize tech debt, we're really satisfying all of our goals. We're reducing that operational expense, modernizing our products, and still reducing our, our security footprint. And I think having that business partner who with a cybersecurity background really ingrained, you get some of those bigger picture views. And that's just another uh, intangible, a tangible item where you can see some of that reduced tech debt footprint that's driven from a cybersecurity perspective and goals. So handful of different uh, intangible items that you can measure in different capacities, just thinking about outside of just what our tools are reporting on and some of those other areas where we're supporting the business. I really like that, Conan, because you're talking about really not that those metrics that people, you know, weighed in on aren't important, but you're talking about sort of extrapolating them to do deeper things, right? So not just, uh, you know, are vulnerabilities going down, right? But actually looking at those in a strategic way and say, is there tech debt tied to it? Is there hardware tied to it? Are there systems tied to it? So, you know, it sounds to me, Joe, like what Conan is saying is that not only is security a business enabler, but that there are methodologies that you should think of as a security person to extrapolate these very finite specific things that you're measuring in a more strategic way that can help the business. Yeah, absolutely. And really what it all comes down to, everything he's talked about before, and I mentioned well, it all comes down to really one thing, which is reducing risk. At the end of the day, that's what we're trying to accomplish, right? We just come in from, from many different ways, right? Moving tech debt, well, that definitely reduces risk, right? Driving the vulnerabilities reduces risk, right? Getting people to understand the importance of not clicking on things reduces risk. And that's really the main thing. If I had one job, my only one, one, you know, one goal, it's that, right? That's my one goal is to reduce the risk of the company. Because then by doing so, it allows them to then spend time and money on other things that are way more important, allow the company to move forward, right? And that's really what it comes down to, is, is that idea of taking that into perspective. And we need to kind of take that too, too many times at Ping and CISO, we, we don't take that perspective of looking outside of our little department and how the whole company is functioning and running, right? And we think what we do is so super special, like we're snowflakes or something, right? But we're really not, right? We just have a different goal we're trying to help the company with. And that really is all around, you know, pushing the risk down and keeping it to a, a you know reasonable level that the company can accept so we can move forward in other areas. Yeah, and it also sounds like you guys both are talking about this is a really great way to prove the value of security spending, right? So, um, you know, want to toss that back to you, Conan, and then have you, Joe, answer it as well. How do you actually prove the value of security spend? And how do you think about, as you're dividing up your budget, where you want to put it the most or what levers you think you should push the hardest on? And how do you sort of prove that spend is effective? Definitely. I mean, I think measuring risk is a good scenario. And then um, certain cases of maybe we were able to implement certain security controls, gain visibility into like asset inventory, a uh, huge thing that I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And from technology side, trying to know where all of your technology footprint is can be difficult. But security tools, we're looking for vulnerabilities in all of our assets so we can help shed light on some things, maybe power some machines down so we're justifying spend by reducing some of that tech debt with some of the tools that we're bringing in. And then uh, a lot of it is becoming a requirement too, which can help in some industries, say if you're in healthcare, financial, from the regulatory side. But I think to justify spend, it's showing the value that you're bringing through customer security questionnaires, through really enabling your sales force to drive uh, more conversations with prospects, customers, showing that like you're in all these conversations as a cybersecurity business partner, in helping us secure revenue, but also still measuring that revenue to show that we're not just a, a cost because typically cybersecurity departments don't generate revenue unless you're selling security as a service. So when you think about we are uh, somewhat of an expense on paper, showing where that expense is getting distributed. Uh, in some cases, if uh, you've been through a security incident, these security tools can save you from staying online too. So there's always a justifying the spend of, hey, we were protected by this EDR solution or 
this penetration test showed us these couple things we were able to fix, so on and so forth. So it's kind of a, a couple of different angles you can take at justifying the spend, I think, show where you're bringing in revenue or supporting revenue from the business while also showing some of that risk reduction where you're eliminating tech debt and saving more operational expenses. So really capturing these different areas and then um, having the conversation with your business leaders too. So that's one of the things I love to do is just bring that picture and roadmap to our business leaders that these are the things that we're doing from a cybersecurity side things. So like each year I come up with a roadmap of this is what we're going to do and then give them quarterly updates. So it shows that we're doing a lot of things from cybersecurity. Our risk is getting reduced. We're bringing in money for the company and people are generally becoming more aware of cybersecurity. So I, those are a couple of angles I like to take on that justifying the spend, just trying to capture the different viewpoints. Yeah, I love that, Joe. I, I, same question for you, right? Obviously, Conan is looking at this from a very, very large enterprise, right? And in particular business unit, but same for you. Like how, how do you think about proof of spend? Yeah, there's two ways that I kind of go about it. One is you can kind of, you know, when you identify something you want to spend money on, I look at it as like, am I helping the business to react to something that may occur? Like, hey, this is going to allow us to react to an incident faster or to prevent a breach more quickly, right? Or to, you know, secure our data, right? So is it kind of like left a boom or right a boom, right? Kind of thing, you know, what is, what's the best way to approach this? And depending on what our risk appetite is, what the risk we have in our list of things we're trying to accomplish, helps me understand like where I need to spend that money. Maybe it's like, hey, we're doing really good on preventative measures. We have all these things in place, but we don't really have a good, you know, backup strategy, or maybe we don't have good offsite storage or whatever it is. Maybe the backups aren't immutable. Maybe that's what I need to tackle next, right? And so it's about understanding your whole ecosystem of the things you're trying to protect um, and what is missing, right? Where are the gaps and how do you address those gaps? The, the other way I look at it is, does it help the business move forward more quickly? You know, Conan brought up being a business enabler. And one of those ways is by actually, when you get those security questionnaires, security is a non-issue. In a sense that like our security is so good that they go, oh, yep, you got everything we need. We don't have any questions. We can move on now to actually talking about the services you're offering and not to spend cycles and meetings talking about your security stature and what you're doing or not doing and everything else, right? The quicker you can get past that, the quicker the business can actually close deals and move forward, which is another way to kind of enable them to be, you know, uh, to be able to spend their time wisely and where they want to spend it. That's great. And I know we are getting a time and we already have some good questions. Uh, so I want to start some questions uh, before we totally run out of time today. So I think um, there's there's been uh, one really good question about aligning spending with the overall IT budget, meaning how do you prioritize services versus security? Um, and that's a question from the chat, which I think is an excellent question. So um, Joe, do you want to take that? And then Conan will have you answer the same question. Yeah, so I think I'm I'm fortunate in the sense that in my role, I actually have IT and security both reporting to me. So I get to wear the hat all the time. Um, but really, to me, again, it kind of comes down to the same, always the same question, which is, if nothing else, we should be reducing, reducing risk. Is what we are going to do going to increase the risk of the company or reduce it, right? If it's if it's all net even, okay, does it help a performance? Does it help a cost? Does it help with efficiency in some other ways, shape, or form? But it's got to have a benefit to the company. It should never be, you know, something that's taking something away, right? So it's it's tricky, right? But you have to have those honest conversations around like, yeah, this is a really cool, great tool, but what is it really going to do for us? Right? Is it really a benefit there? What is that benefit? Is it on the IT side of the house? And is that IT benefit then, you know, impact security and make it worse or better? Right. So at the end of the day, for me, security is always going to trump anything IT wants to do. It's got to take first pass. And Conan, you're not in your head. Do you do you agree with that? Definitely, because I mean, there to uh, Joe's point. I mean, we're, we're trying to protect the organization at the end of the day. So when we're thinking about prioritizing some of those different spends, um, I think having just that collaborative relationship too, understanding like what IT is trying to do. And certain cases, is it satisfying like a single customer, single ask, or is it something that we can look at a broader spectrum of like where the spend might be? So I think it's having like to Joe's point, some of those honest conversations about where do we stack this with priorities? Look at maybe our top two to three things for security or top two to three things for technology side and understanding how these go together. And sometimes they can complement each other. Maybe we're 
looking to move to a different service where we can integrate a security tool a lot better uh, in some of those cases or get better visibility. So it definitely depends. But uh, at the end of the day, we, we just got to make it more of a collaborative effort and bring those different pieces to the table to we'll understand where security is a business enabler and we're not just spending the money to spend it in some cases. So we're really showing some of that uh, return on investment with vulnerability reduction or satisfying larger requirements for the company in some of those matters. That's great. And we've got a great follow-up question to that that just came into the chat is, um, what are some low cost or no cost tools for an organization who's just starting to focus their efforts towards cybersecurity? So, you know, Conan and Joe, think back to maybe earlier in your career when you were just thinking about building out cybersecurity programs, what kinds of tools just generally would you have started to think about when you were first starting out on your journey? So I, I can jump in. I think, you know, the uh, CISA organization, you know, government organization has some really fantastic resources and tools and guidance. And it used to be they were only really good for like large businesses, you know, enterprise size businesses, but they've actually gotten much better at having some really good uh, frameworks and guidance for small businesses and how to protect themselves and how to implement security in, in a smart way. It even have some automated tools that let you to scan, you know, like your Microsoft environment and get a report out to see like, are you doing the right things and protecting yourself? So it's a really great tool as well. And then of course the CIS as well has some really good foundational stuff. Like, look, if you did nothing else, if you just do these like, you know, 10 pillars and just then you're already going to be better off than a lot of your peers, competitors, right? So there's no shortage of good information out there. The hard part is when you go through it, identifying where do you start? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, it's a lot. So you may go through this whole thing and find, well, we got 20 things we got to do. Well, which one do I do first, right? And my advice there is like, just pick something, anything. Anything you do, any step forward is going to be better than where you are today. So just grab something. Maybe it's the one that's the most you know, maybe it's the easiest or it's the one the business can support the best, right? Maybe it's not the one you'd like to do. Don't worry about that, right? Focus on the one the business can get behind, push that forward, then go back and do the next one, right? But just keep chipping away at it. It's never going to get easier. So you just have to keep pushing forward. That's a that's great advice, Conan. What would, what would you say to that? I would double down on that. I mean, it's an ongoing thing. In some cases, people call like like Patch Tuesday, like whack-a-mole to some extent. So it's ever-changing. Like anything that you can be doing is better than nothing. And one of the other aspects, I think, is start with the people. I mean, if you're at a company, really start educating people. Use CISA. It's a great resource. Uh, start engaging. Just education sessions. That's one thing I like to do like just once a month right now is pick a topic and start educating the masses because the more people we have, doing things like maybe looking at how they set up their infrastructure, maybe looking at how they set their roadmap, what code repositories they use. Some of these different aspects, if you just get them thinking about cybersecurity a little bit, that's a free resource in itself is the culture change aspect. When you get some of the culture change aspect, you'll get some of that more buy-in down the road. Uh, there's definitely some some open source tooling that you can use. I think to Joe's point, CIS is a great resource. They partner with a lot of organizations too, but even the tackle on start somewhere, um, access control, a big piece too, and try to just gain visibility into your environment and do what you can, when you can with the resources you have available to you, and then continue to build off that. Um, a lot of stuff has configuration changes you can make. So it's, it's kind of looking at what you have and what you can do with it, and then really start making some of that culture shift along the way. Great answers, you guys. I think we have another, this is great. We've got such great, uh, Great participation. So I think this question is alluding to thinking about company revenue and how do you compensate for making sure that you're balancing company revenue, but company security, and where are you putting in those compensating controls in the company with that revenue and securing that revenue in mind? Yeah, I think I think it's a little tricky at times, right? But I think... Um... Keep in mind that our job as security professionals is not to make the decisions, right? In, in a lot of ways, I look at my job is I am there to consult and advise, right? So I come in and say, look, you need to do X. And this is my recommendation on how you should handle it. And if you don't, they'll be like, well, we don't want to do that because it's their point. It's going to affect revenue. It's going to do this. Okay, here's some compensating controls we can put in place then to reduce that risk while still protecting us, right? But at the end of the day, it's a conversation between you and the stakeholders, you and the business, and the business has to own that decision, right? I can't decide for them. 
Um, they wouldn't let me if they wanted to, right? So um, at the end of the day, I just have to have an honest conversation. Like, this is where we are. This is the risk that is open to you. Here's ways to address that risk and options available to you. What is it you want to do, business? You want to do X? All right. And even if I disagree with it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark that down. I'm going to say that this is decision was made. This is why it was made by these, this date and time. We're going to move forward. I'm going to move on. I can't get caught up into the politics around it or anything else because there's too many other things out there I got to focus on. So you got to kind of like do your best, you know, put it on a risk register, note it and move on. Yeah, Conan, same question to you. I think this is a really good point about disagreeing and committing, right? As Jeff Bezos would say, but go ahead, Conan. Yeah, I mean, I would double down on that too. I mean, it, at the end of the day, we have to document it, like look at like a risk, risk register type of scenario, making sure that the business is choosing to accept something. We are just making recommendations uh, at the end of the day. And I, I think well, one thing that I like that Joe kind of mentioned, it's he's not saying no and closing the door. He's saying no, but here are a couple different options that you can do for compensating control. So I think having that open, honest conversation of, we're not saying you absolutely can't do this because at the end of the day, we are just like consulting that case where, providing options for those recommendations. So we're enabling them while also still protecting the organization the best that we can with what's available and still documenting it in the risk register along the way. Uh, and even from the revenue standpoint too, that's why I think capturing some of those like ARR requirements where like Joe brought up, sometimes the security questionnaire is step one before they even open that door. So when you can capture some of these items ahead of time, you can see how security is a requirement and these investments are requirements and our contract verbiage and our prospects that we're bringing on board, or if we're in a regular regulated industry, they're a requirement in that case. So we can document these cases and show where the revenue is directly tied to how well we uh, defend ourselves and how well our cybersecurity architecture is. And even you think about cybersecurity insurance, another thing where it's a category of some of these things are required. So I think making some of these business cases to business leaders and getting them to understand cybersecurity and why it's very important, it enables the business and why it's an investment versus the cost. It's really that culture shift to where revenue spend to cybersecurity spend can go hand in hand and showing that we're making a lot more revenue because of the spend that we're investing into cybersecurity. Yeah, and I think Conan, so there's a, a question in the chat about how can we encourage organizations to prioritize security testing, including physical security. And I think, you know, for your business, obviously transportation and a lot of things Trimble does, those things are really high on people's priority lists. But I also think what you just said, it sounds to me is what both of you are saying is that really explaining to people how security is a business driver, that it's not just a cost center. Um, but do either of you have other thoughts on sort of how to encourage the business to prioritize security testing, even even physical security, and sort of get that top of mind? Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes a requirement, which helps. I would say that, I mean, I've had customers say that, hey, we require this test to even move past step one. But in other cases, it's showing them the return on investment. There's plenty of stuff that happens in the news nowadays for us to pull real life examples. Um, say in the transportation logistics industry, say whatever industry you're in, pull the real life examples, show some of the case studies behind there and how they can apply to this space that you're in and really collaborating with your leaders to show the importance. And I think everybody looks at from a monetary value, it's pretty cut and dry, but also understand your audience and tailor the message to your audience and show the metrics or the data that you need to, to tailor to that audience, whether it's a business leader, whether it's um, CFO, whoever that might be to get the buy-in. And then once you get the buy-in, also continue to measure and continue to report to show that return on investment. So if they say, do a comprehensive security test, show them what you got out of it, how you fixed it and how the organization's better because of it. And Joe, same, same question for you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Conan, right? There's a couple of different ways you can go about it. One is you never let someone else's <laughs> problem go to waste, right? Use it. But I think you can't just like take the headline and go, did you see this, right? Because I think there's so much of it that's happening now that you can really easily just get glossed over. It's like, yeah, yeah, I saw, yeah, we have another breach, whatever, right? But I think more importantly is to, to try to identify one that actually, like this company aligns very well with our company. They're the same size, same makeup, maybe the same industry, right? And show, and you maybe use that to say, look, this is where we're exposed in that same way. This could have been us, right? So really kind of try to highlight that similarities and try to show like, not I hate using, I don't want to use fear, but it's more around like, 
making sure they're aware of like eyes wide open. This is where we are, whether you want to admit it or not. This is, you know, this is the risk we have before us, you know, and we're in that same boat. We just didn't be, we just weren't the ones who were attacked today, right? So that's always one aspect. You know, the other aspect is on the physical security side, there's actually a lot of, you know, free tools out there. If, if anyone's using Noble 4, for example, they have a really cool USB drop tool where you can actually load up a thing on the USB, drop around the office and see who picks it up and plugs it in, right? So there's, again, there's, there's things out there you can utilize to help make your point. Um, but lastly, I'll also, you know, hang on what Conan was saying as well, which is if nothing else, leverage compliance, right? Everyone likes to say compliance is check the box, but compliance can help security, right? When you can't get it over the goal line and you got to get it there, leverage it. It'll be like, look, you know, I know you don't really want to do this, but we have to, to get our SOP to, or our customers expecting this, right? Because at the end of the day today, pen testing and conference testing like this really is table stakes anymore, right? This is no longer like a luxury. This is what everyone should be doing on a regular basis, you know, not just because they're supposed to, it have to, because if they don't, they're just leaving themselves wide open to more risk. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to say, Joe Conan, like, I think this has been one of the most interesting conversations I've had in a really long time. And I want to thank all of you who've been here listening and participating and asking really fantastic questions. I want to make sure you all know that we're all on LinkedIn. So please feel free to continue the conversation on LinkedIn. Reach out to Joe, reach out to Conan. I think we've had some really interesting conversation. Um, and please continue. Feel free to continue these conversations. They're really important conversations to have. Uh, thank you so much to Joe and Conan for your time today. I know how busy both of you are in your job. So I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us today. And uh, Thanks for everyone's time and please feel free to continue the conversation. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Buff. Thanks, Conan.